It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, Steve. <laughs> and the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hi. We've got a great show today, and uh, I want to start off by kind of setting the predicate, as Ralph is fond of saying. In 1947, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, required licensed radio and television broadcasters to present fair and balanced coverage of controversial issues of interest to their communities, including by granting equal airtime to opposing candidates for public office. This policy was known as the Fairness Doctrine and lasted for 40 years until it was rescinded at the end of the Reagan administration in 1987. This led to the proliferation and domination of the radio waves by right-wing talkers such as the late Rush Limbaugh. Today, social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have supercharged a whole new generation of pundits, thought leaders, and frankly, conspiracy theorists in a media landscape that resembles the wild, wild west. Broadcast media amplifies the misinformation and disinformation arising from these new media platforms. This is a threat to the civil discourse that is vital to a healthy democracy. But how can you have civil discourse when no one can agree on a basic set of facts? Everyone has their own facts, or as coined by former Trump aide Kellyanne Conway, alternative facts. We each can live in our own information bubble that confirms our biases and offers no rebuttal across examination. How do we get a handle on this? How can we burst the bubbles? Well, our first guest today, Professor Nicholas Ashford, will be joining us to discuss his recent op-ed in the New York Times, in which he argues for resurrecting the fairness doctrine to help stem the flow of misinformation over our public airwaves on broadcast media. After that, we're going to switch gears a bit and discuss the storied career of former Attorney General Ramsey Clark, who passed away this month. We're going to be joined by two guests who profiled Mr. Clark on the page and on screen. Lonnie T. Brown is the author of the biography Defending the Public's Enemy, and Joseph C. Stillman directed the documentary Citizen Clark. Both of these works examine the iconoclastic attorney's family life, his civil rights activism, his controversial legal clients, and his lifelong dedication to justice. They'll be joining us for the second half of the show today. Then if we have time, Ralph will answer some more of your listener questions. But what we always make time for is our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, can the Fairness Doctrine be resurrected? David? Nicholas Ashford is director of the Technology and Law Program at MIT. He has published several hundred articles and numerous books, including Technology, Globalization, and Sustainable Development, Transforming the Industrial State. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Nicholas Ashford. Glad to be here. Welcome back, Nick, indeed. Before we get into the points you made in your New York Times op-ed on March 29th, how much of all this that you're decrying comes because people are allowed to make false statements and false concepts of who did what and where anonymously? Well, there are two problems. One is, yes, those people are making false comments. And secondly, we have lost our capacity to do critical thinking and to separate the wheat from the chaff. Well, what if you write a letter to the editor? The letter doesn't get printed unless your name is attached to it in print newspapers. But online, a huge amount of lies, misinformation, slanders, verbal abuse comes in anonymously. Do you see any problems with the government basically saying to Facebook and Google and others, you can't transmit anonymous assertions like that? People got to put their name behind their claim. I think that would be a better thing, although I'm not sure that divulging your name is not known. It would stay in the memory of the listener anyway, or people can make up names. I don't think the question is a question of anonymity. I think the question... It's a question of whether the facts are complete and are not erroneous. I think that's the problem. The point you make in your op-ed is that the broadcast television radio pick up these false statements, conspiracy theories that are false, and just replay them. And, of course, they did this with Trump every day of the year, and they even replayed a lot of false statements on the COVID-19 pandemic by Trump. 
And they would be much more rigorous before social media and the internet in doing this sort of thing. I know as consumer groups, if we made a false claim about an unsafe pharmaceutical or whatever, the press would not use it. And they would check with the manufacturer and make up their own mind and not use it. And so why are they picking it up? Nobody's forcing NBC, ABC, CBS, and CNN and others to pick up the false stuff that's on the social media, unfiltered. Well, I don't know how many of those things are unchecked, but certainly fact-checking is important. But the fairness doctrine as originally constructed is problematic for a very good reason. Just giving unequally meritorious arguments equal space is not really keeping in the spirit of the fairness doctrine. You have to not only present meritorious arguments, but you have to offer criticism, not just simply display opposing views. There's a problem here because if most people get their news from the platform and then they also hear it repeated on Fox News or on talk radio, they tend to be much more believing of it. So the fact that it occurs a few times on TV or the broadcast media or radio does a lot of damage and amplifies the message on the platform companies. That's the problem. That's why we need to not only rein in the platform companies, but we have to rein in all aspects of the media so that not only our meritorious points of view dealt with, but criticism is levied where criticism is due. Well, let's give an example here. If a radio station broadcasting over the public airways, where they have to have certain accountability, which people on social media do not, or a television station is constantly putting forth supportive assertions about nuclear power. They keep saying how great it is, it doesn't create pollution, it's blah, blah, blah. And they never point out the negatives of nuclear power. Or they are broadcasting Verizon's claims about how great 5G is. Verizon's been putting huge advertisements on how great 5G is, and they don't give the other side. And that's what the Fairness Doctrine, which was repealed in 1987, as Steve pointed out, was designed to deal with. And we'll get to that in a moment. How would it work if there was a Fairness Doctrine, which I want to explore further and why it was repealed and the role of right-wing talk radio? How would the Fairness Doctrine operate? Nick, who would trigger it to get the other side of 5G? Well, I think that we need citizen juries or a commission that regularly oversees what the media do. I mean, when I wrote this op-ed, it's interesting for the New York Times. They didn't let me say anything which I couldn't confirm and back it up. And if you look at the electronic version as opposed to the print version, you'll see the blue type, which takes you to the source of my assertions. Well. That's fact-checking, and fact-checking ought to be routine for people. When people do not offer a meritorious, a legitimate, opposite perspective, I think that we don't want the government to sit as judge and jury because that has its own limitations. But we can have commentators or we can have citizen juries comment, check the press. I mean, when Walter Cronkite was alive, he might have been the most trusted person in the media that exists because nobody ever expected him to present one-sided views. Well, my recollection is that an ordinary citizen could call up and ask to invoke the Fairness Doctrine and say, I have an expert at MIT who has another view of the hazards of 5G. And it's up to the radio or TV station or the network to be sure, but they would very often respond affirmatively and they'd put on another viewpoint on what the Fairness Doctrine called controversial issues of importance. What would you say if there was a Fairness Doctrine and you had called up the Boston television station and said you gave a one-sided view, I want to invoke the Fairness Doctrine, assuming it was in place, what would you say about 5G? Well, I'll tell you that. I'll answer that in a question. But first of all, I'm calling for an enhanced fairness doctrine, not just 
of including the one that was done away with. And I think you need an ombudsman receiving end of the media to take the accusation or the the affirmation that the important views are being left out, and they ought to have a responsibility to make sure that the right ones get put. Now, 5G, which is being promoted, as you say, by many of the internet companies, actually, there's a great deal of evidence that it's dangerous for people to be using phones with 5G, let alone being near a radiation pursuing radio towers. But 5G seems to be in the air everywhere in Europe, in China, in the US, and it is a dangerous technology. Furthermore, there are articles which have argued that the broadcast industry actually doesn't need it. It's something which makes things cheaper for them, but that the public itself can't possibly use all the bandwidth that is being promoted by them. So 5G is an example. So is global climate change, an area where you don't give equal time to equally meritorious ideas. The the term equally meritorious is a very important term. It means somebody has to sit in judgment and be accountable for responding one way or the other to the concept of fairness. Well, I remember very clearly, Nick, we're talking with Professor Nicholas Ashford at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Being at the FCC, the day the FCC announced the revocation of the Fairness Doctrine, and we didn't really fully realize the damage. It was clearly the get-out-of-self-restraint card for all the right-wing media. Rush Limbaugh loved it. All these other right-wing syndicated radio show hosts just went up the wall with whatever they wanted to say. And there was not only no rebuttal and no alternative views on that station that carried these programs, but there wasn't any countervailing progressive radio talk shows that come close to the extensive syndication of these right-wing radio shows, which basically captured a good deal of the blue-collar workers and turned them into Reagan Democrats, as they were called, because these workers never heard any other view, day after day after day. They, you know, they were pounded with this absurd, all government is bad except military empire and corporations are great. So after that, we went up to Congress to establish the fairness doctrine by legislation. And there were great majorities in the House and Senate. And it went over to the Senate and Rush Limbaugh unleashed his hordes of objectors gave the switchboard to the members of Congress. And I I was there. I mean, the phones lit up in one office after another and scared off the members of Congress. And now you can't even get a discussion about the fairness doctrine. It has been reposited in the taboo pits of public issues. How would you get this ball rolling? Well, I have to, first of all, regrettably, I have to say that simply presenting opposite perspectives doesn't necessarily convince people who are already committed to a view. I mean, what neurological science shows us is if you give somebody a balanced report on the one hand, global climate change doesn't exist. On the other hand, it does exist. It turns out that people imprint in their own minds and reinforce their priors. So at a minimum, you have to present opposite perspectives, but you have to do more than that. You have to cross-examine people with different perspectives. You have to do more of what CNN does than Fox News does. If you don't let put people in a hot seat and make them defend their perspectives, just presenting two sides isn't enough. I'm not convinced that that will, you know, just resurrecting the fairness doctrine as it existed is going to be good enough. Uh, And by the way, it's interesting that some news outlets talk about fair and thorough reporterings. And there is a a difference both within the left-leaning and within the right-leaning talk radio and television. There's a difference the extent to which they go to extremes. In Britain, there's a program called Hard Talk, where an interrogator takes a person of note and subjects them 
to an hour of cross-examination does not let them not answer a question, which is what sound bites do. And at the end of the hour, you have a pretty good idea of what the truth is. I mean, they don't let anybody get away with anything from the left or from the right. And that is a better model. If you don't engage people in the viscera of their bodies to engage in an argument, you operate under pretty primitive brain power and you aren't going to persuade anybody. So the fairness doctrine by itself, as originally constituted, is not nearly enough. You have well, to have people do fact look, checking. Good point. You made comments in your op ed article on basically two types of media social media and broadcast media, which includes cable, and I would add telephone carrier media. So no one is saying that AT&T, for example, or a telephone company should police what people say on its telephone lines. Nobody says that. But there's not much exposure there. Right. When it comes to social media, you get all kinds of views. Civil libertarians say don't go after uh, Facebook and let uh, people say whatever they want. On broadcast media, there's the public interest, convenience, and necessity standard in the 1934 Communications Act, where they really just can't go whole hog. They shouldn't, that is. I mean, Fox News did go whole hog, and I would alert the FCC to do something about it, because it's so horribly one-sided and often very false material that some of these commentators or reporters on Fox News were purveying. And you'd never get an answer from the FCC under Trump. It was a total toady of the well, media. Well, it happened before Trump. The FTC is underfunded. They'd much rather, like the Security and Exchange Commission, they'd much rather reach an accommodation and a settlement of a prosecution than prosecute violations. All of the regulatory agencies have fallen under Trump into not prosecuting violations. I mean, hitting pennies on the dollar with a settlement is not the same as prosecuting bad behavior. And we have to refund the regulatory agencies that regulate our airways, our chemicals, financial instruments, so that they are really empowered to prosecute violations. There's nothing like a prosecution to change people's mind. How about a defamation suit? These two companies that were involved in the elections technically involved Dominion, for example, they have sued Fox News because Fox News commentators pilloried them mercilessly, saying they were responsible for stealing the election day after day, night after night. And finally, these two companies are fed up and they filed multi-billion dollar defamation lawsuits against Fox News. What do you think of that of tool? Well, I'd like to know what the settlement is going to be. They may never go to court. I mean, that's the problem. You know, when courts see that settlement is offered, even if it's for pennies on the dollar, they don't want to have those lawsuits. So, you know, a lawsuit, filing a lawsuit will get people's attention, but executing it to the end would take somebody who is more interested in prosecuting the violation than the money that they could get from a settlement. And that settlement preoccupation is a major problem with our judicial system. Because the real information doesn't get out, you're saying. There's not a trial with witnesses and cross-examination. Well, that sometimes the settlement is even sealed, as you know. When That's you right. seal the settlement, you don't talk about who got what for what. And you know this concept in the law called nolo contendere, which is in Latin translated as no contest. It really means I did it, but I promised not to do it again. I didn't do it, but I promised not to do it again. So, you know, that, that, that's no publicity that is worth very much. I think with Fox News, if, if people are carried through to prosecution of the suits, then perhaps we'll get where. But you know, the courts of appeal have cut down the punitive damages that are associated with something. I mean, you have to prove real damages to get a certain amount of settlement, but then there's punitive damages which, whose purpose used to be to deter future action. But the courts of appeal have routinely cut those punitive damages down. I could only need to tell someone better than you who's up on the issue of torts 
and it has this tort museum in Connecticut, which people ought to go to and see, to see how tort has changed over the years. Well, in your op-ed, you have a key sentence, and I'll quote, quote, a phrase that's based on a lie and trends on Facebook and Twitter, namely, stop the steal, in quotes, for example, becomes right. fortified and legitimized when it's picked up by television and radio reporters or commentators whose words then reappear back on social media, fueling a tornado of misinformation, end quote. Good and quote. Why in the world would these networks continue day after day repeating what Trump and the Trumpsters say about stop the steal when they know that it's false information and they actually have some of their commentators rebutting? They actually rebut on the air. They say, this is not supportable. This is not factual. But they keep reporting it day after day. If a consumer group did that, they'd be cut off, period from the media. Well, I'll answer your question with a question. Who owns the media? Who owns the media? If the private sector participants who have an interest in this area own the media, they're going to do the screening they want to screen. Well, what about NPR and public broadcast? Well, NPR is hopelessly dependent on the government for renewing their license. It's not like the BBC, which has a line item and cannot be so easily Curtailed. I mean, in the national public radio, which I watch, and uh, television, which I watch, is much better than most of the broadcast or cable news. But it still is very careful about what it says. I mean, have you heard anything on public radio about 5G? I haven't. No, there's nothing. You know, they have their own taboos, for sure. But Twitter, Facebook, Google... They have protection by the Congress. It's called Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, which currently exempts these companies from being held responsible for material they publish. I'm quoting from your article. Tell us about Section 230, Nick, and what you would do about it. Well, there's a lot of talk about repealing the immunity, which is given from suits against those carriers or using antitrust to break up large internet companies. I don't think either one of those things goes anywhere near far enough. It's not the lawsuits that you have to concern yourself with. It's the presence of an independent governmental or non-governmental organization that's going to call a spade a spade. I mean, you have to have ombudsman-like organization that does look at what these people are doing and measures them not against liability suits, but restrains them from doing it in the first place, demands corrections. So you just leave 230 on the books? Look, I think if you eliminate the immunity given to them, they, it will do a small amount of changing, but it doesn't go very far against sort of pro forma adherence to the fairness doctrine. I mean, you, there is a way of presenting the other perspective, which is not powerful, which is not convincing. And aside from that, I've already mentioned the fact that listening to two sides of an argument doesn't necessarily change people's minds. It is a necessary but not sufficient innovation. You have to subject the purveyor of lies to cross-examination and challenge. That is what CNN does. That is what the public television does. But the other channels, right and left, don't do enough of it at all. They don't embarrass somebody who has a point of view. You have to go as far as embarrassing somebody who tells exaggerations, omissions of fact, omissions of view, People would be afraid to be on your interview schedule if you really took people to task. But that's what we have to change. And you would include advertisements, corporate deceptive advertisements? In the well, my goodness, if you looked at the amount of snake oil that is now promoted by the television and radio news, do you believe you can grow hair if you've lost it? Do you believe you can be socially at ease by taking a pill? I mean, the FDA and the FTC are too busy 
to prosecute what is really horrible advertising. I don't think that misleading advertising ought to be allowed. By the way, here's a good example that supports your thesis. In the 60s, there was the emergence of the anti-tobacco movement and led by a law professor at George Washington University Law School, John Banzaf. He went after tobacco advertising on TV. And of course, the tobacco industry is very powerful. And he got the FCC to require the television broadcasters to allow anti-tobacco ads. So one ad that I remember, it uh, was very memorable, it showed a dying lung in full color, you know, cancerous dying lung in full color. And the second view of the ad was, that's Marlboro country. And it was so horrifying to the tobacco companies that they voluntarily dropped all tobacco ads on TV and radio. There's your point, don't you think? Well, sure. But short of terrifying ads, you know, a lot of public service announcements are shown between two in the morning and four in the morning when nobody's watching. So what about putting it at prime time during a football game? I mean, you need to have access. You see, there's a battle for your attention going on. There's a battle for people's attention. And the private sector and the owners of the media know how to get people's attention. There's a whole industry dedicated to that. But we have to get people's attention to start thinking in the right way. And by the way, the long-term solution is to bolster our education system, which has caused people to graduate without ever being able to distinguish propaganda from news. Most important course I ever took was in high school, and it was called propaganda. So how you recognize both governmental and industrial propaganda. And I'll, I'll never forget that course because it imprinted in me what to look at. And we really need more critical thinking on the part of the listeners. That's an educational initiative. But we also need the people who are putting forth information, whether in advertisements or quasi-news. They need to cross-examine and challenge views which are otherwise sacrosanct. Very true. The high schools should have propaganda courses. You can teach a lot about the political economy, elections, the marketplace, just by giving students an opportunity to develop critical tools and differentiating propaganda from facts or right. lies That's from correct. truth. And not that there are shades of gray. I mean, we're not talking, listeners, about shades of gray here. We're talking about someone who says this election was stolen and that I, Donald Trump, won Georgia by hundreds of thousands of votes. I mean, you know, you, this is... Or global climate wall. change is a hoax. Global climate change is a hoax. So before we let in Steve and David, one last question. What kind of reaction did you get? This is the most valuable media real estate in the United States, the op-ed page of the mighty New York Times, read by well, decision I, I makers. Got, I got overwhelmingly positive responses. I got one poison email that said I should go live in China. Did you get anything that extended your concerns that you could say, hey, this brings a step forward? I got a lot which argued that I've hit a nerve that wasn't hit by talking about the repeal of Section 230 or using antitrust. I mean, the Congress is consumed with those two cures for the problem, but they're not going to come anywhere near curing it if we don't resurrect an enhanced fairness requirement on the part of all media. Well, I suggest you try to get Senator Markey or Senator Warren, those are your two senators, to put this article in the congressional record. Uh, that's one way you can test their commitment to the concerns that you're raising and the proposals that you're making. Well, I hadn't thought about that, but I, that's a good idea. Steve, David? Yes, this is really important to me. So thank you for this conversation. I think government has to step in. You know, Derek Chauvin is guilty, and it became a fact when the jury ruled that he was guilty. 
we trust, despite our lack of faith in government, we trust the government to conduct a trial. The GAO, the General Accounting Office, the Congressional Budget Office, and Inspector General, nobody really argues with those findings. It's nonpartisan. Shouldn't the government set up a BBC-type news organization or three news organizations like Voice of America, like Al Jazeera? Because we do trust the government to tell us what the facts are. The inquisitorial style of a a Senate or congressional hearing gets both sides of a story. Unfortunately, you can't get the transcripts to a congressional hearing. Nobody knows this. I've tried to get transcripts to congressional hearings. They're never published. They're never in print. They only have But you can hear them on C-SPAN. You can hear them on C-SPAN. But it takes you eight hours to watch it. It, it Go back to your main point that people could trust certain kinds of government agencies. They certainly couldn't trust Bush and Cheney on lying us into the criminal war that blew apart Iraq. But right, you're but talking the, about inspector both, generals, the general accounting CBO, office. Yes, uh, yes, they, like they, they've been. I think somebody once said. I think a Republican once said the CBO is the closest thing to God. So they do, they do trust this kind of oversight and the inquisitorial style of a Senate or congressional hearing allows Americans to really get both sides. They can listen to Jim Jordan and then they hear Maxine Waters. And you really do get to decide the argument, but you can't read them. There are no transcripts. It's too short in time. Giving people five minutes to do the cross-examination is not enough. It's not nearly inquisitorial enough. And I tell you, we used to have an Office of Technology Assessment, which was eliminated because Bush didn't like their criticism of Star Wars. I mean, I would worry, I'm not a libertarian, but I would worry about putting all of the control in the government to establish safety. We have the Justice Department now investigating Minneapolis's police department to see whether the the Chauvin characteristic goes further within the department. I'm not convinced that our Justice Department now is capable of really doing a job that they should. I think we need expanded congressional oversight. We need interrogation by interviewers of the people who are insisting that black is white. And I think the government has not told us the truth about international affairs since the Korean War. But they have, like the church committee has. There are Uh, elements. let's, Let's give Steve a chance. By the way, CBO stands for Congressional Budget Office. It does have a pretty good reputation for being fair-handed. And Nick is right. You know, they never used to restrict members of Congress at congressional committees to five minutes each. You can hardly get into it when a senator is trying to cross-examine a corporate executive and it only has five minutes. So, Steve, before we close. Yeah, I just wanted to inquire. I think when the Fairness Doctrine was instituted in the 40s, there were very few broadcast networks or radio stations, or a lot fewer of them than there are now. And won't people argue that we don't have that kind of scarcity anymore, that there's plenty of TV and radio stations offering all different sorts of point of view, and who's decide what's meritorious? Well, I think you need a citizen commission or, or citizen juries to decide to, to weigh in. You need ombudspeople in the agencies and in the media who are accountable, who are accountable, who make the argument and argue on factual basis whether somebody is telling a bold-faced lie or else. I mean, if you remember the way that Zuckerberg was questioned by Congress, he kept on saying, I don't think I can answer that question. I don't think I can answer that question. Well, you know, the retort should be, you've got to answer that question. You're in front of the public. You have a lot of power. I insist that you answer the question. How many times did Zuckerberg say, I can't answer that question, or I'll check it out and let get back to you later? By the way, Nick, the networks have solved the problem that you've talked about in radio and TV when it comes to progressive groups challenging corporate power. 
they put out one deceptive statement or one false statement about a consumer product or a deceptive marketing practice, and, and they'll never get on again. <laughs> they, they know how to censor progressive groups, but they let the right wing and they let people like Trump on again and again and again. Well, again, I would ask, who owns the media? Who owns the media? Corporations. That's the yeah, I mean, the public areas are owned by the public, as we've said many times on this program, but they're controlled by corporations called radio and TV broadcast cable companies, and the advertisements are largely corporate. So you've got a corporate-dominated media. Which is why we need a government. We need government radio and government newspapers like to Like the C CBC in Canada or the BBC in uh, Great Britain. Public, public radio is not a good model. No, because it's not funded by the government when you think about it. It's not a government radio. No, it is licensed by the government. Right. And but that's it's an enormous power. I still say to you, if you haven't had a chance, go to the UK's program called Hard Talk. And if you can show the Congress people what real interrogation looks like, I think you will make your point. Well, we're out of time, unfortunately. We've been talking with Professor Nicholas Ashford, who's worked for many years on the relationship between technology and the law. I think, Nick, we've had far more technology than law in recent decades. But I hope that your two senators will carry your concerns into the U.S. Senate, Senator Markey and Senator Warren, and put this article in the congressional record. Thank you, Nick. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. We've been speaking with Professor Nicholas Ashford. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Let's take a short break. When we return, we're going to celebrate the life of the late Ramsey Clark. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, April 30, 2021. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Gary Gensler has chosen corporate criminal defense attorney Alex O oh to head the SEC's enforcement division. O oh represented big banks in litigation surrounding their role in the 2008 financial crisis. She represented Fannie Mae after they were caught deceiving investors and giving their own executives inflated bonuses. In 2006, O oh testified in front of the House Financial Services Committee during the investigation into Fannie Mae's fraudulent accounting practices. O oh defended ExxonMobil against a lawsuit from Indonesian villagers who claimed that Exxon hired military security for their natural gas facilities who inflicted human rights abuses on the town. She's also defended big pharma companies in multiple lawsuits. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. The name Ramsey Clark may not be familiar to most people today, but in the words of our next guest, quote, name virtually any controversial historical episode between 1961 and 2017, and the odds are that Ramsey Clark had some connection to it. So let's hear the story of Ramsey Clark. David? Lonnie T. Brown Jr. is the chair of legal ethics and professionalism at the University of Georgia School of Law. He teaches courses in civil procedure, the law and ethics of lawyering, ethics and litigation, and is the author of Defending the Public's Enemy, The Life and Legacy of Ramsey Clark. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Lonnie T. Brown. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, Lonnie, I never thought your biography of Ramsey Clark was given due respect and coverage. And I hope that more people will read it following the loss of this great public citizen. My interaction with Ramsey makes me think that after he was forced to make some compromises as attorney general under Lyndon Johnson, and he had to deal with people like J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, that when he left government service, he told himself he was never again not going to take his conscience to his work. He will never again self-censor himself or say what he doesn't believe in. And so whether it's civil rights, whether it's the U.S. empire abroad, the invasion of Iraq, civil liberties, transgressions, uh, defending the dis displaced and the deprived, don't you think he was true to his word? I do. And I, I would say that he took that approach within the administration as well. But 
he he met with some resistance and was not able to accomplish everything that certainly not everything that he wanted, but he accomplished a lot of things. And contrast to, I would say, our most recent attorney general, he was incredibly independent and took stands against Lyndon Johnson that Lyndon Johnson was not happy about. When he got on the outside, he was freer to do the things that he wanted to do. And I, I agree with you that in dealing with people like J. Edgar Hoover in particular, he became very skeptical of the way the government handled things. And he saw that things that were being portrayed to the public weren't necessarily true. And I think that informed a lot of his representations, you know, a lot of his humanitarian efforts, his visits to Vietnam and to other countries that were viewed as, as enemies of the United States. But um, he was true to his word, I think, while he was in administration, and he became even more true to that once he, he exited the Department of Justice. He had a tough role because on the one hand, he had Lyndon Johnson on his back, very opposed to Ramsey Clark's opposition to the Vietnam War. He used to make fun of Ramsey. And then he had J. Edgar Hoover trying to get dirt on Ramsey to control him as he controlled so many politicians. He had these dossiers and he couldn't find anything on clean Ramsey Clark, so he couldn't control him. But I think Ramsey was really upset when he had to play this role of prosecuting some anti-Vietnam War protesters. I think that really disturbed him greatly, and he resolved never to do this again. But I, I like in your book, in the chapter that says, I am a man, that you mention, quote, all the more galling to Hoover, though, was the fact that he had no dirt on Clark, with some record of marital infidelity as he had on Dr. King or other influential leaders. Hoover could exert negotiating leverage to get what he wanted. However, with regard to Clark, there was no file of indiscretions. And that's the great thing about Ramsey. He was incorruptible, a great figure in American history. But the more he lent his celebrity status to groups that were fighting war, groups that were fighting for domestic justice, but couldn't get any press, the more he got less press. He was not afraid to use his capital, but his capital started being diminished because he was representing all these groups who just happened to be right again and again on their facts and their principles. What do you think the, the principal lesson, which I think all law schools and undergraduate political science schools should teach about Ramsey Clark? He should not be forgotten to history. No, I, I, I really think he's one of the most misunderstood and overlooked figures in contemporary American history. And as was alluded to in the intro, he's almost literally touched every major event throughout our history. And Largely, you know, not only from a political science standpoint and, and just as a, as a leader, but, but as a lawyer. And I think you know, law students can, can take a great lesson from him in terms of how he conducted himself and what he did, his passion. He taught a course at Howard University Law School for a number of years called Law as an Instrument of Social Change. And he believed that that was true, that that was the, the greatest tool for attempting to affect social change in America and abroad. And, and he used that throughout his life. I mean, that was his commitment, both in terms of his time at the Department of Justice and definitely when he exited the department. And his representations were, many of them were controversial. And in the book, I kind of go into the fact that some were, were really inexplicable. But I think at his core, he believed the law had to have integrity. And I didn't agree with all of his representations, but I, from getting to know him very well, I believe that, that he believed in what he did and he would not have taken on a cause unless he believed in that cause for some reason. And he was very effective as assistant attorney general and attorney general in getting the major historic civil rights laws through Congress. So he wasn't just a protester or a dissenter. And then when he got out, he picked up on something very few people have the guts to do. He was saying no matter how brutal the dictators are, when they are brought to the dock of justice and they are being prosecuted, they must be embraced by the rule of law and have competent counsel. And he did that in Yugoslavia. He did that in Iraq. And he got a lot of brickbacks. 
But it's hard to argue with this point that when you get the worst people as defendants of a criminal prosecution, the only way you really uphold respect for the rule of law is if you apply the civil procedures and allow the defendant to have competent counsel. Yeah, he definitely agreed with that. And and in a lot of the international matters in which he became involved, such as representing Saddam Hussein, he believed that Victor's justice was at work. And he never liked it when he thought it was Victor's justice and that those who had achieved victory were putting the tools in place for adjudicating the guilt of, of individuals. And so he thought it was important for him to inject himself to ensure that there was fairness in the process, both in perception and maybe in fact, to the extent that he could could do his job. Well, thank you for coming on the program. We've been talking with Professor Lonnie Brown, Jr., who teaches at the University of Georgia School of Law and is the author of a rather recent book, 2018, Defending the Public's Enemy, the Life and Legacy of Ramsey Clark. And I urge people to read this book But even more systemically, this book should be part of the curriculum in courses on political science and law, not to mention civil rights and civil liberties seminars all over our country. Thank you very much, Lonnie. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with Lonnie T. Brown. We will link to his book, Defending the Public's Enemy, at RalphDayRadioHour.com. And to continue the story of Ramsey Clark, this time in documentary film form, we turn to our next guest, David. Joseph C. Stillman is an Emmy-winning, Academy Award-nominated filmmaker and the director of the documentary Citizen Clark, A Life of Principle. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Joseph C. Stillman. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, welcome, Joe. When this came out, you had an event in Washington. I was privileged to be a part of it. Just before you finished this documentary, Citizen Clark, And it was a project that was long in formation, and it covered Ramsey Clark's life, as you say, to bring to light the story of one of the world's most dedicated individuals to the causes of peace, justice, and human rights, end quote. And in the documentary, it appeared that Ramsey was a very modest person, a very unassuming person. And how did you get around that? How did you show people what a huge impact he had on the civil rights legislation in the 1960s, and how he's been the standard for standing up against injustice, abuse, criminal wars, and other travesties. Well, as you know, Ramsey led a very complicated but simple life. And I think if there's a word to describe him, he was a fearless individual who did not care what people said was compelled to tell the truth at any cost, and certainly put himself in numerous situations that were dangerous to his life in order to bring those facts forward or to tell those truths. My relationship with Ramsey really went back some 12 or actually 16 years ago when I was doing a film about a returning Iraq veteran, and Ramsey was in the film. And We had a screening in upstate New York, and after the screening, someone in the audience said to Ramsey what his thoughts were about the possibility of a nuclear war in this country. And he gave this incredible explanation of how such a horrific event like that would play out. And then that person in the audience said, it sounds to me like you're not too optimistic about the future of the United States, to which he replied, quite the contrary, I'm an optimist. And without optimism, there is no hope. But I'm not just concerned about the future of the United States. That will be immaterial because it's the future of mankind that we're talking about if such an event like that were to happen. And I'm sitting there just awestruck with the complexity of Ramsey's thought process because he looked at every incident that our government was involved with and others From a world perspective, he was a humanist. I finally was able to, after a a lot of prodding, I I said, Ramsey, how do you consider yourself? And finally, you know, he didn't, he just said, well, I don't think in those terms. But he eventually said, I guess you could say that I'm a humanist. And I think that that was probably the best description that I've ever heard of who he was as an individual and how his life was lived. 
Well, you're right there, because when we had Ramsey on our program almost three years or so ago, I tried to get him to talk about himself, and he said, well, I, I just, I'm just not very introspective. He didn't want to talk about himself. He wanted his actions and his words to define him. And indeed, in this documentary, you have done that. If people want to look at this documentary or use it as a educational tool in college courses, high school courses, uh, tell them how they could access it. Sure. Well, they just need to go to the website, www.lifeofprinciple.com, and all the information is there. You know, they can order DVDs, they can find places to stream it, they can call us or contact us. You know, we've showed it at universities, and the new school did a, a wonderful presentation for Ramsey's 90th birthday in the city three years ago. So it's all the information is there, but the film actually covers a 90-year time period from 1927 up until the shootings at, at, in Parkland, Florida. And there's about 35 different segments within the film, but it pretty much sums up Ramsey's life from that perspective. Yes, indeed. It's a gripping documentary, and it's almost like a revelation of the best of American history and the civil rights movement. And he was part of the civil liberties movement, part of the peace movement. It's not just the Quakers or the Unitarians who would love to see this documentary. We've been talking with Joseph C. Stillman, who is an Emmy-winning filmmaker, who's traveled the globe making substantive films and documentaries for 46 years. And his documentary on Ramsey Clark, former attorney general and public citizen extraordinaire, is called Citizen Clark, a documentary on the life of the former U.S. Attorney General and human rights activist, Ramsey Clark. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Ralph. We've been speaking with Joseph C. Stillman. We will link to his film, Citizen Clark, A Life of Principle, The Ramsey Clark Story, at ralphnaderadiohour.com. All right, let's do some listener questions. David. This question comes to us from James Aguino. Hello, Ralph. I recently came across a book by Jerry Frisia called Towards an American Revolution, where he argues the flaws within the U.S. Constitution, such as the failure to provide checks against private corporate power and the undemocratic system, two-party duopoly and electoral college, it creates, are in there by design. As you know, majority of the framers came from the colonial elite and would have liked to maintain power in the newly established United States. Furthermore, reverence by the American people to the Constitution and founding fathers presents an obstacle to radical new ideas for improving society compared to other Western nations, such as France. As an expert in law, should we advocate for a new Constitution, start kind of like a second republic, in order to rein in the extent of corporate power and put the citizens first. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I've said for many years, the expanding Achilles heel of our republic is the lack of any mention of corporations or companies in the Constitution, and therefore the lack of any differentiation, which would have led a even more prescient constitutional group of framers to subordinate the artificial entity, a name known as the corporation, to the supremacy of human rights, the rights of real people over the rights of commercial corporations. So we really need at least to start a informal citizen convention on how to update the Constitution. I mean, how pressing do you expect James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and George Mason and others to have been? They couldn't have foreseen the new kinds of surveillance technology, new kinds of silent violence, weapon systems, the new kinds of corporate SKP systems from any kind of accountability, the international global penetrations of human and civil rights and bringing higher standards in our country to lower common denominators abroad. So we definitely need that. But it's got to start with a group of advocates, scholars, practitioners to get the discussion going. Because, you know, as they say, if we ever had a constitutional convention today, hold on to the Bill of Rights, you might lose half of them, never mind updating the Constitution to meet new challenges for justice. 
So you don't believe they gave us the tools, we're just not using them properly? Yes, that's right. They gave us the tools. The amendment process is a little bit more onerous than I would have suggested. But it's not just the tools, David. It's We have to have concrete visions. We have to have much broader public education. We haven't had a political system that discusses these grand issues of the concentration and distribution and accountability of power in a presumptuous, democratically-based republic. And that's our show. I want to thank our guests again, Professor Nicholas Ashford, Professor Lonnie T. Brown, and Joseph C. Stillman. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. The transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to Nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to CorporateCrimeReporter.com. And Ralph has provided two separate form letters to send to your representatives demanding they take action on corporate crime and taxing the rich. Just click on the clearly marked boxes in the right-hand corner of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour landing page, and it's all laid out there for you to fill in and personalize any way you want. Go to ralphnaderradiohour.com. Take action. To support Whirlwind Wheelchair, visit whirlwindwheelchair.org. That's whirlwindwheelchair.org. They do wonderful work showing people in the United States and around the world how to build sturdy, economical wheelchairs from local materials. Whirlwindwheelchair.org. And for an independent news source that believes people are more important than corporations, go to populist.com to read or subscribe to The Progressive Populist. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we'll welcome Alec McGillis to discuss his expose on the inner workings of the Amazon delivery monster in his book, Fulfillment. Thank you, Ralph. And what an expose it is, listeners. By the way, those of you who get any response on the tax letter and the corporate crime letter that you're sending to members of Congress, when you get response from your members of Congress, please send us copies. Thank you. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up. First, David asked Nicholas Ashford about one of his pet peeves. This is maddening to me, Professor. You cannot get transcripts. You cannot read hearings. So when Zuckerberg goes before the Senate, there are great questions that he's being asked. You have to wade through eight hours of testimony to watch, but you cannot read the transcripts. They will not make it available. Well, that's that's an Internet phenomenon. You see, they'll just refer you to the Internet, and we've got to get transcripts. For years, we've gotten transcripts, David. You just call up the day after the hearing, and they'll send you a transcript. Now they don't do it. So get on Schumer, but you, your senator. But, but you do have you do have public radio and public television capsulizing these negative comments by Zuckerberg. I think you don't need to watch eight, you don't need eight hours of transcripts. You can watch the summary presentations by these people on the evening news on public television. You can get it if you want to. You I respectfully you disagree. Want. I I respectfully disagree, sir. It was Mike Gravel who introduced the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record. There's no disagreement here. You got a congressional hearing. You should get transcripts and within a reasonable time printed printed hearings. They don't even print the hearings often, Nick, anymore. Of course I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I have Uh, this problem all the time. I call up and they don't have anything. Hannah just found something. Published hearing transcripts contain all witness testimony. This is on C-SPAN, Hannah. The question and answer portion of the hearing and any other material requested of the witness by the committee, it may take several months or even years for a hearing to be published. Unlike most Mm -hmm. other congressional documents, hearings are not available from the Senate or House Democratic rooms. You may be able to locate a hearing from GoInfo, GPO. I've tried. uh, From a committee website or from a federal depository library. It's outrageous. I think think I'll bet you there's a commercial company that does it for for a nice fee. Yep, exactly. Write Schumer a letter on this.
and send me a copy, David. Okay. Because he's old enough there. He's been there long enough to know what it was like when they were responsive and they put out immediate transcripts. Right. I mean, if somebody were covering what's I, going on in the Capitol, it would be real news. I just wanted just, to clarify, C-SPAN auto-transcribes most of the hearings that they have available on their website. And then the text I quoted was from the Senate.gov link. But the auto transcription, I've tried to download it. You can't get it. They won't let you download the transcripts. That is true. Why? Why? Same reason you have to pay for freedom of information by the page. And now Steve asks a question of Professor Lonnie Brown about Ramsey Clark. We have an extra minute. I would just like to ask you more of a personal question. As a scholar and political scientist, what drew you? to Ramsey Clark? What what made you say, hey, this is the guy I want to write about? I actually I write a little bit in the book about how we sort of cross paths a few times. And then in my civil procedure course, I taught a case in which he was sanctioned for filing a lawsuit against Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher after the bombing of Libya. And I taught that course over the years and became more and more curious why the former attorney general would, would file such a lawsuit. And he, he was in fact sanctioned. And I just learned more and more about him. And the more I learned about him, the more fascinated I became. And then, you know, as, a, as an African-American person, I was intrigued by his work throughout the civil rights movement. He was really, you know, I think one of the unsung heroes of the movement, the things that he did, his protection of the Black Panthers and other Black citizens and his investigation into the various riots that took place in the 60s. And I just was thoroughly intrigued by him. And when he agreed to represent Saddam Hussein, I decided that I would kind of dive in and start researching his life and write about that. And that was sort of what got me on the path to writing a book about him. What did he say about policing in America while he was attorney general? Seems so relevant now, doesn't it? So relevant. I've written a few law review articles and it's in the book too. The parallels are just dumbfounding. I mean, the exact things that happened in Watts and in Detroit are happening today. And he was really tough on the police in terms of federal prosecution. So he was very vigilant and he, he usually lost, but he always did that. And he was content that by sending a message of accountability, he would make the police officers think twice. He wasn't a, a defund the police kind of person. He was very supportive of law enforcement and felt that it needed to be significantly reformed. Uh, police officers need to be paid more. They needed to be professionalized. And he was one of the first proponents of community policing, getting the police officers actually in the community and involved more so in crime prevention than injecting themselves after the fact. But he was, I mean, vigilant in terms of the the combativeness between the police and black citizens and his efforts to try to prevent that from happening and was, was quick to act when incidents like those we've seen you know, throughout history occurred. So was his father, which is really interesting too. His father was the attorney general for Harry Truman. And he similarly you know, pushed forward some prosecutions like that back in the late 40s, which is kind of amazing. When he was attorney general, he said police violence is one of the worst kinds of violence, right? Yeah. And he said, you know, who's going to protect the public when the police you know, violate the law? That was you know, something he repeated over and over again. And he, he really, he wrote a book, Crime in America, where he spent a lot of time talking about what needed to be done, both with the penal system to fix it and with policing. And that was you know, one of his principal focuses. And I asked him about, he was always hopeful. He's a very optimistic person. And he was despondent that, you know, we talked about Ferguson and compared it to Watts. And he was sad that that occurred, but he was still hopeful that that we'd get it right at some point. But there just needed to be the commitment, the sustained commitment to do something. And he's just never seen that happen. It never has happened. And that's a wrap. Join us next week when we welcome author Alec McGillis about his book, Fulfillment, which outlines what Amazon is doing to local communities. Until next time. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way.